The Sunday Gospel reading from the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time reminds me why liturgical architects have so much in common with world wrestling entertainment owner Vince McMahon, arguably the greatest heel in the history of professional wrestling. Like the villainous Mr. McMahon, the designers of the lectionary have committed a screw job on both the Gospels and Jesus. Look very careful at the Gospel reading. What's missing there? What the hell happened to verses 9 through 13? Or verses 16 through 20? Why did the lectionary masterminds gut the passage like that? Why did they vivisect it and sew it up again, Dr. Frankenstein style? We have another lectionary screw job, folks. To see it, pause the video and take up and read this whole passage, marking carefully the uncomfortable parts our lectionary leaves out. As we've seen before, Mark and the other Gospel writers lived decades after the Jesus Movement. When they wrote about Jesus, sometimes they didn't get him. And that does get reflected in their writings, which represent interpretive portraits of Jesus, never photographs. But unlike our lectionary, they never betray Jesus by intentionally transforming him into something he wasn't. In other words, they don't commit screw jobs on Jesus. For example, the evangelists, elites, honestly but wrongly thought that Jesus was a rebel and an iconoclast, and they praised him for it. Ironically, Jesus' enemies themselves, urban elites, also imagined him to be both rebel and iconoclast, but they condemned him for it. Folks, Jesus didn't keep the great tradition of Israelite urban folks. Not because he was a rebel who didn't want to, but because he was poor and so he couldn't afford to. Because Jesus was a starving Galilean villager, he kept the little tradition of peasants adapted for Israelite peasant life. In empathy, place yourself into the sandals of peasant Galilean Jesus. He was itinerant, which means he was seen as a social deviant, long before he ever became a folk healer. How could he afford to observe the tradition and purity laws of urban elites? Think about the water he would need to take all those mandated baths and ablutions. And then consider his followers, fishermen. All Jesus' fishermen friends were constantly touching dead things and other pollutants. Like Jesus' urban elite enemies, his third generation fans, the evangelists, wrongly interpret and present him to be a rebel. And unlike his enemies, these gospel authors celebrate Jesus for being such an iconoclast and rebel. They were incorrect, but honestly so. Unfortunately, not so the designers of our lectionary. The gospel reading as presented today is a lectionary screw job worthy of Vince McMahon from the WWE. It betrays the historical Jesus and the mark and interpretation of him as well. Mark says that Jesus saying about defiling and non-defiling foods is a parable. Now think about that. By calling it a parable given to the crowd, Mark is telling us quite a lot. Why does Mark speak parables to outsiders? Read carefully Mark chapter 4 verses 10 through 12 to find out why. Please be consistent reading Mark, people. Why would the Mark and Jesus tell the crowd a parable and then give an explanation exclusively to his insiders? Compare the omitted Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 20, with Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. Doesn't Jesus want the crowd to get him? Jesus explains his stories only to his followers, insiders, but never to the crowd, outsiders. 
Today's lectionary screw job betrays Mark and Jesus by editing out Jesus' Mediterranean secrecy and deception for outsiders. This lectionary screw job strips Jesus of a key element from his Mediterranean culture and therefore also from the Inn of Incarnation. Unlike the United States, no outsider to your core group deserves the truth. That story's meaning is for the Jesus group alone. Outsiders have no right to it. My friends, that's uncomfortable for the hierarchy. They cannot tolerate, will not tolerate, the real deal Jesus. So, they require a construct named Jesus, who is culturally congenial to the West, who always speaks plainly and clearly to both insiders and outsiders alike, to both church and world alike, one who is never secretive or deceptive. In other words, a faker. A fake, controllable Jesus made after their own image and likeness who keeps people under control. Hence, their lectionary screw job. And rank and file Western parishioners sitting in the pew? We're no better. Western Christians will not tolerate Jesus as he was. It's because we crave a Jesus who is buying Western values. BS artists, we love to ask, WWJD, what would Jesus do? Once we honestly ask that question and grapple over it, we too will commit identity theft on Jesus, just like the lectionary screw job does. So a couple days ago, I posted something on the lectionary screw job that was the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time Gospel reading. That displeased a lot of people. Somebody asked me, and what key verses do you believe were omitted? And what do you think they may add to the meaning? I had to tell them, look, I don't believe these verses were omitted. I know they were. Take a look for yourself. Here is the gospel reading for last Sunday, the 22nd Sunday in Ordinary Time. Open up your Bible and see. Look at the verses. You got Mark chapter 7, verses 1 through 8. Then, strangely, it skips ahead to verse 14. Then after verse 15, it skips ahead again to verse 21. What's going on? One thing's for sure. Obviously, editing happened. So we should ask, what happened to verses 9 through 13? What happened to verses after 15, but before verses 21, 22, and 23? Now, verse 16 not being found in our best manuscripts, most ancient manuscripts, okay, I can take that. Don't include verse 16. Verse 16 not being included, that's fine. But what about verses 17 through 20? Why did the lectionary masterminds gut this passage like that? Well, as my previous video presentation clearly showed, those passages reveal uncomfortable realities. Uncomfortable to 21st century Western folks realities that shatter the cultural congenial Jesus popular at Sunday school and homilies. Popular at religious education and RCIA, Rite of Christian Initiation for Adults, group meetings. This lectionary screw job betrays Mark and Jesus by editing out Jesus' secrecy and deception to keep outsiders in the dark. In other words, it strips Jesus of a key element from Mediterranean culture. Well, I explained this to the person asking me the question, and he responded, Okay, well, I I'm, I'm not seeing that at all. Verses 17 through 20 add nothing to the passage. It just says the same thing again. In verses 9 through 13, that that's about following the command to honor parents. That being left out doesn't intimate what you say either. Well, let me just say this. He's precisely right that he is not seeing it at all. And hopefully, it is a case of can't see it, rather than won't see it. Here are some good questions when reading any biblical passage. Who? What? When? Where? Why? That's what gives you context. The context of the saying is complex, and tearing that text out of its context is irresponsible. 
Interpreting the verse on its own out of context is impossible. You can all understand the English sentence, he hit it. But not a single one of you can interpret it. You don't know who he is, you don't know what it is, and you don't know what hit means. You can understand it, but you can't interpret it. You need context. Context, context, context. One, to whom is Jesus speaking in Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 15? Go look and see. Two, what is he telling them? To find out, read the omitted Mark chapter 7, verse 17, and about why Jesus tells parables, and to whom he tells parables, in Mark chapter 4, verses 10 through 12. 3. When is Jesus speaking? In Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. Does this happen before or after he spoke? In Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. 4. Where is Jesus speaking? In Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. Is he speaking in the same place he was? In Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. Or has he moved? 5. To whom is Jesus speaking? In Mark chapter 7, verses 17 through 23. Is he speaking to the same people he was? In Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 15. These questions matter, otherwise you don't understand what's going on. 6. Why are verses which show changes in who, what, where, and when omitted by the lectionary architects? By this editing, what becomes of the context of the passage? If you read the selection we get from the lectionary, you would think that Jesus is teaching, not giving a parable. And the reason for that is because verse 17 is omitted. By the way, why did Jesus tell parables again? Mark chapter 4 verses 10 through 12 gives the uncomfortable answer, uncomfortable for Western people. The answer is a Mediterranean, Middle Eastern answer. We Western people don't like those over here in our part of the world, regardless if we are liberals or conservatives. This has nothing to do with politics, this is culture. Secondly, reading the Gospel selection from last Sunday gives the impression that Jesus not only teaches the crowd, but explains his teaching to them. That's very comfortable for us Westerners. We love a Jesus that is the intellectual sage, teaching us step by step everything. Not only insiders, but also outsiders. But that isn't the case. Upon close inspection of the whole passage uncut, and in light of the uncomfortable reason for telling parables to outsiders given in Mark chapter 4 verses 10 to 12, it becomes apparent that this is a story featuring Mediterranean secrecy and deception, not teaching. And that's uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable to catechists and directors of religious education. That's uncomfortable to teachers of Christian doctrine. That's uncomfortable to bishops. Ever hear a Christian tell you that their church uses the entire Bible? That theirs is a Bible-believing church? Don't believe them. When we say that we use the entire Bible, we Christians are engaging in the worst kind of lie. Not only deceiving other people, but ourselves as well. Consider this with the question, how should we do church? That's a question all Christian traditions ask and attempt to answer. And so all of us look to the New Testament as a source for ecclesiology today. Ecclesiology meaning a theological examination of what the ecclesia, or assembly of believers, is and should be. So the New Testament serves all Christian traditions and groups both in a descriptive and a prescriptive function. Descriptively, the New Testament provides the best evidence of what the universal Jesus group and the local Jesus groups were actually like in the earliest period of their individual and collective histories. Prescriptively, the New Testament provides normative criteria by which to answer the question how should the universal body of Christ and individual communities within the body function today? 
But let's not get ahead of ourselves. We Christians must resist the temptation to jump too quickly to the more engaging level of prescription before the hard work of description has been completed. Both the descriptive and the prescriptive tasks are affected to one degree or another by the matter of the canon within the canon. What's that? The word canon is derived from the Greek kanon, for rule or list. The canon of sacred scripture is the official list of books that the church, post-Constantine, regards as inspired. All Christian groups agree at least upon 66 of these books. And we all agree on the same 27 New Testament documents. And we all, in one way or another, consider the books of this canon all official, authoritative, and inspired. At least that's what we tell ourselves. However, several biblical scholars, including James D.G. Dunn and Richard Rohrbaugh, refer to another canon, a canon within the canon. That is, an unofficial list of texts and themes that have become normative for some scholars and church traditions in their interpretation of the whole of Scripture, and particularly the whole of the New Testament. Whatever the theory of canonicity, Dunn writes, the reality is that all Christians have operated with a canon within the canon. Anyone who uses his New Testament a great deal will at once acknowledge that some pages are more grubby with finger marks than others. All Christians, no doubt, operate on the principle of interpreting the unclear passages by means of the clear. But of course, a passage which gives a clear meaning to one is precisely the unclear passage for another, and vice versa. Folks, the canon within the canon tends to be, for all practical purposes, the real canon. It is the real Bible we read. It is the part of the Bible that we, in our particular Christian groups or traditions, actually use. And the rest? We ignore. While giving lip service to reading the whole Bible, which is a self-deceptive lie and utter nonsense, all Christian groups, Catholics and Orthodox included, shrink the canon down to the parts of the Bible that each of our groups thinks is theologically and culturally congenial to us. This little teeny bit of the Bible is what we deem usable by us and compatible with who we are in our specific Christian groups. Is it really an oversimplification to say that until very recently, the effective New Testament canon for Catholic theology, especially for Western or Roman Catholicism, has been Matthew chapter 16 verses 17 to 19? and the pastoral epistles, 1st and 2nd Timothy and Titus, together with John chapter 21, shunted to reinforce Matthew chapter 16, verses 17 and 19? It's not an oversimplification, that's a fact. That is the real Bible for most Catholics. The canon for most Protestant theology has clearly been some letters of Paul. For many Lutherans, indeed, justification by faith is the theme that is the real canon within the canon, so emphasized that it interprets or distorts everything else in the library. Eastern Orthodoxy and the mystical tradition within Western Christianity draw heavily or principally from the Johannine writings. While Pentecostalism looks for its authentication to the book of Acts. Or again, the canon for 19th century liberal Protestants was the so-called historical Jesus. I should say the so-called historical Jesus is plural, because for every scholar in the 19th century there was a different biography of Jesus, really an idealized autobiography of the author himself. 
Whereas after the First World War, the focus of authority for many Christian theologians became the kerygma, the proclaimed message. This is how it was for people like Rudolf Bultmann, influenced by Martin Heidegger. While more recently, others have sought to orient themselves in relation to the apostolic witness. Now you might object and say, well, my Christian group, let's say I'm a Catholic, I, I follow the common lectionary. We read the entire Bible in a three-year period. Stop it, stop it, that's nonsense. Look at these books on the screen. The common lectionary barely covers any of these books. And when it does, it twists these verses out of the context from the original books, giving you a Frankenstein splice of different texts in what amounts to another canon within the canon. Perhaps most arresting of all, we have to remind ourselves, and by we I mean all Christian groups today, since in the New Testament, proto-Orthodox or proto-Catholic ideas are only one strand within the entire New Testament library, consequently, Orthodoxy itself is based on a canon within the canon. The truths that were arrived at by the Council of Nicaea and Chalcedon are also based on a canon within the canon. Like it or not, then, all Christians have operated and continue to operate with a canon within the New Testament canon. Since the New Testament library, in fact, enshrines such a diversity of first century messianist beliefs, it cannot be otherwise. So it's inevitable today that you're going to have Christians, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox included, that will look at Paul and his writings and find him most congenial. And right next to him is another Christian, maybe even from the same tradition, who will recoil from Paul and find his writings repugnant, but be perfectly relaxed with John. And yet another Christian comes along and is puzzled by both of his fellow Christians because he can't stand Paul or John but prefers the simplicities of acts and the orderliness of the pastorals. You know, when we recognize the reality that each of us does in fact operate with a canon within the canon, it gives us much to think about. Like, should we ever really use the term Bible Christian or Bible-based church?